Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, and yeah, as he said, my name is Chris Woodward. I am the developer relations engineer at Arango DB. And uh, today I'll be talking about Arango BNB, uh, a project that we made as a clone site for um, sort of a, a like a Airbnb clone site, vacation rental site, um, where we developed everything in full stack JavaScript and uh, with the intent of using a data set containing GeoJSON data. Um, this project, it was a community project, or is a community project, I should say. We're still actively developing it. Um, we made this with a couple other members and the ArangoDB community, and currently it is living in our ArangoDB community GitHub org under the name ArangoBNB. And uh, we are definitely open to new contributions. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end on potential ways that you can contribute. Uh, a new way I actually found out uh, just this morning uh, that if, if you were so inclined, you could uh, uh, help <laughs> resolve some uh, a new issue that popped up. Um, today's agenda will be a brief introduction to ArangoDB, what, what the database is. Uh, this will just be a really short intro for those that just aren't familiar with ArangoDB. Uh, a GeoJSON introduction. Uh, this serves as almost more of a overview of the GeoJSON spec, sort of a I, I read it for you so you don't have to sort of thing. Um, and then we'll follow that up with a quick demo of the site. And then we'll start diving into a little bit more of the details of the project itself, kind of like how we started some of the planning, some of the initial data modeling considerations. And then we'll just take a, a quick run through of the tech stack. Uh, I hope if I have time to provide a short uh, like sort of demo there for getting started with some of the technologies that we used. And then finally, we'll wrap up with uh, yeah, how to contribute and, and where we hope the project goes from here. So uh, as I said, my name is Chris Woodward. I'm the developer relations engineer uh, at ArangoDB. And so sort of what that title means is uh, I'm in charge of a, a lot of different things at Arango, uh, but my main focus is definitely focusing on training and helping with getting started with development using ArangoDB. Um, so this comes in the form of uh, videos, uh, you know, uh, conference talks just like this, but then also guides. Uh, we have a large number of Python uh, notebooks that you don't actually have to, to know Python really to use or to benefit from. Um, we have a number of those all available on our website, wrongwaytob.com slash learn. So if you are interested in that sort of learning, uh, especially with some more of this uh, machine learning or data analytics side, um, that's a great place to start. I am involved in community outreach, working with community members to um, to do things like highlight the projects they're working on. Um, we're always happy to do what we call a community pioneer, uh, which is a webinar with a community member that just wants to show off how they used ArangoDB in their project. Um, this can be uh, something you use in production or just a fun project you did on your own. Um, so definitely reach out to me if you do have any interest there. And then I am also a member of the Arango ML team. And uh, that's our uh, suite of tools available to machine learning professionals um, we have uh, things such as Network X adapters, DGL adapters, uh, and we also have the uh, ML pipeline um, that serves to capture metadata throughout your machine learning process, um, and so a number of other tools available as well, as well that we're, we're actively developing and, and constantly growing that team. If you have any questions about any of that or, or want to reach out to me for any reason, definitely feel free to do, throw, do so through Twitter. Uh, or you can reach me on our ArangoDB community Slack. That uh, My name there is chris.arangodb. OK. Uh, so now let's go ahead and dive in. This will be a really, really brief uh, intro just about what ArangoDB is. Uh, ArangoDB, we call ourselves the first native beyond a graph database or the first native multi-model database. Um, ArangoDB was started as a company in 2015. And at this point, we actually have two uh, headquarters one located in San Francisco and the other in Cologne, Germany. Um, we are an open source product. We, we were developed with the community from the start. We have the Apache 2.0 license, and we also have an enterprise edition uh, alongside our community edition. We have well over 65 employees at this point. We are currently in a state of rapid growth. Uh, we have uh, definitely well over 11 million downloads, over 600 plus uh, product installations. 
And uh, to date, I know that this number is kind of constantly growing, uh, but we have over 12,000 stargazers on GitHub. Uh, that's a number that we're very, very proud of as uh, our, our community, of course, you know, has been with us the entire time. And, and we love that this, uh, you know, this is this is the way we see a lot of interest coming is is uh, with the growth in Stargazer. So if you do end up liking it, please give us a star on GitHub or uh, a review on G2 Crowd. Uh, we are a G2 leader uh, on in multiple areas on, on G2. So feel free to drop us a review there. OK, so what is WrongDB? As a native multi-model database, um, that gives you access to multiple data models in a single database store. So uh, for us, that means that you have access to a full document data model. And uh, this comes along with uh, all the uh, functions and, and interactions that you would expect from a, data, a document data store, um, as well as the ability to uh, use your data as key value, as a key value store, and then finally as a graph data model. Um, sort of the benefit of all of this is that um, you can treat your data the entire time as a, as a document store. You can uh, do your lookups and everything just like you would normally expect. Um, but then let's say one day you do decide that you know, there are some relations you like to represent in your data. Well, making that same data into a graph is as simple as just you know adding another collection, and now um, you you're able to define these relationships, and um, just uh, the flexibility of this. Uh, also, you could you could kind of uh, throw both of those to the side and say, actually, my, I just have key value data, and so then you could just use a ArangoDB as a key value store. Um, and then we kind of take all of this one step further by making all of this scalable. Um, and that's really uh, where, where I think we shine, especially in the long run, is that uh, not only are we a graph database, we are a scalable graph database. Um, we also have a built-in full text search engine, um, which is a bit more than a search, uh, a full text uh, index. And we'll talk about that in just a second because uh, Arango Search is actually the basis for some of the stuff that we did in this project. Um, Arango search, uh, and, and I'll, I'll cover that in a bit, but Arango search is a uh, full text search engine that allows for fully federated text searches along with ranking and similarity functions. Um, and it has a, a number of what we call analyzers built in that allow for performing complex text transformations uh, for existing data and uh, new, for, you know, for new insertions. Whenever you insert new data, we can perform these text transformations. Uh, for you automatically. Um, there's a lot to cover on the Arango search side. We're only going to look at a really brief slice of it today. Um, but uh, moving on, the we also offer iterative graph processing in the form of Preggle. Um, we have a number of built-in Preggle algorithms as well as an experimental Preggle feature that we're working on right now that you know, feel free to test that out that allows you to define your own custom Preggle algorithms. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm on the Arango ML team, and that is the team that is focused on uh, providing graph ML and analytics tools and, and trying to serve those use cases more. Um, we have a really a large number of offerings there, and, and this is something where um, we know is emerging. So if you want to see something or you want to contribute just a, a, you know, input on where you'd like to see that go, please let us know. We're always, always happy for any sort of feedback or, or collaboration. Um, and uh, then moving on to Kubernetes, this is our Kubernetes integration. Uh, we actively maintain this uh, integration because it's uh, actually used in our ArangoDB has a cloud database offering that we call ArangoDB Oasis. It's a completely managed cloud database service um, and if interested in that, that's a really simple uh, way to get started with the RongoDB is uh, you can have a 14 day trial of that. And now you have your database running in the cloud. Um, and it's just on a, kind of the, the quick, simple way. But um, so what does all of this coming together provide the developer? And for us, we think the biggest benefit is, is you know, reducing complexity while still having all the right tools for the job. So all of this came from that polyglot persistence idea. Um, so being able to use the right tool for whatever job you're working with. And we think we, we've achieved that for a large majority of the use cases. Now, of course, we know that um, you know, maybe NoSQL isn't always the right tool for your job or something like that. But 
um, the, it comes along with this single source of truth where you get all of the all of these data models and you don't have to worry about data consistency because you're always accessing the same data store um, this all all of these have native c++ access to the data um, and this also comes along with reducing the need for developer knowledge so they can learn one product one query language and do everything they're going to need to do um, this of course, it comes along with less maintenance whenever you have less databases and faster performances whenever you're needing to make fewer hops across um, to multiple different databases. Uh, this 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 sort of uh, reducing of that complexity is is just continues to have benefits there. And uh, everything we we really target is using AQL. Um, this is our the ArangoDB query language, and we had to do this because, as you can imagine, SQL doesn't do graph traversals and and definitely doesn't support uh, multiple data models. But uh, if you're familiar with SQL, learning AQL should be very familiar. OK, and um, I'm going to go ahead and continue on from here. I will go ahead and try and keep a, an eye on chat. So if you do have a question, please let me know uh, as we go through this. Uh, I know it's easy to start talking quickly, um, and especially with some of the stuff if you're not already familiar with GeoJSON. Um, hopefully, uh, seeing uh, some of the examples and things like that will help. Um, but so for this section, uh, it's going to be more of just a what is GeoJSON, look at some of the spec details that might help uh, uh, define that for you, and then uh, we'll see uh, how we use that later on. So uh, GeoJSON is a format for encoding a variety of geographic data structures. I pulled this directly from geojson.org. Uh, that website also has the spec, the link to the spec, if you did want to read it. This is going to be the, the, the TLDR version, um, and specifically some of the stuff that I wanted to point out was what we use in our project. So it's actually not a very long read either. So of, as far as uh, uh, specifications go, uh, I would say that, it, yeah, it's an it's a easier read than others. <laughs> Um, so uh, GeoJSON is just JSON, right? So it's just JavaScript object notation with some uh, required members and attributes. So uh, at the end of the day, it's just JSON, but the spec just defines uh, some of those some of those attributes that it refers to as members. So I'll try and use that term as well. Uh, GeoJSON objects require type attributes. Um, they can also have the B box attribute or the bounding box to define the the area that you, you're interested uh, of getting these coordinates in. And it may have what are called foreign members. Foreign members are these sort of like uh, ways to add descriptive information to your GeoJSON object. Uh, the spec sort of says like, you know, you can do this, but ideally you should shy away from it. And this ends up being one of those implementation specific things where someone might be implementing GeoJSON and you know, providing a library for you to use where they say, OK, you should have these attributes uh, because it makes sense for that use case. Um, you know, example being maybe even something like a restaurant you know, and then providing the restaurant name. You know, not part of the spec, but maybe it makes sense. And there's actually even a better way to do that. Uh, we'll see later with the uh, properties um, attribute of, of features. Um, but this is available there as well. And, and they further define what, what some of that stuff should look like in the specification as well. So um, the the like probably the most common thing you'll see when working with GeoJSON are going to be its GeoJSON types, um, and and the like umbrella term is just the GeoJSON types. But what that actually consists of are seven geometry types and two what the specification refers to as GeoJSON types. Um, and the GeoJSON types actually does contain all of them. So of the geometry types, we have point, multipoint, line string, multi-line string, polygon multi-polygon uh, and geometry collection. Uh, there are some things that each of these require, um, but while working with GeoJSON, this is going to be what you come up against uh, most often. This will be primarily what you're concerned with, like what, what shape is the geometry data that I'm working with. And then the GeoJSON types, the feature and feature collection, uh, serve as sort of an organizational structure. And we'll take a look at an example. Actually, we'll go ahead and do that right now. So. On the right here is, again, pulled from the specification. This is an example of a feature collection that contains features. In this, in this case, I think we've only got, well, we've, we've started on our second feature, but one, one full feature is what we're looking at here. 
Um, so object types, which is uh, the area I have highlighted in yellow, we're looking at a GeoJSON object um, that is contained within the rest of this, which we'll also explain in a minute. But those types must be a geometry type. So looking back at the last, it must be one of these on the left side. And so our uh, this one is highlighting a geometry type of point. So that's just a single point on the map. Uh, and it must contain coordinates array with zero or two or more positions. So uh, why the, the call out for zero is that, again, this is all just JSON. So for JSON, no values are supported. Generally, I mean, you're going to have either two or more. Two in this situation is the most common. common. Um, there is an option for having third, which tells you about elevation. And you can even add some more uh, to this, depending on the implementation that you're working with. Uh, one such as one thing was like a timestamp. So, um, but but for the most part, you stick with uh, two to three is I think the most common. And, um, and I've even seen the switching of uh, longitude, latitude. So I wanted to make a call out for that to make sure that you know whatever implementation you're working with. The specification does say long lat is the correct order. But uh, as we all know, that sometimes uh, the developers don't, don't mind adding their own uh, flavor to things. So. Uh, and so the shapes, so, so sort of what this all looks like, the number of coordinates and, and that sort of thing uh, really depends on the geometry type as well. And, and we'll take a look at uh, really a, a nice example that um, is available online for you to play around with as well. So uh, feature objects. So this is, uh, it needs to have the type of feature, has a geometry member. So that one we were looking at earlier is our geometry member of this feature and feature collection. And the uh, properties member can be any JSON object. So this is where I was talking about where if you're defining information about like restaurants, you could put a property value here, such as restaurant name and then its name. Uh, and then the, the features collection is the, the top level structure for uh, defining the GeoJSON features that you have. Um, and so this is uh, really, this covers a large majority of what you're going to run uh, come across while working with GeoJSON out, out in the real world. So um, one, one way I thought that might help kind of bring this all together would be to take a look at this uh, pretty cool site I found called GeoJSON.io. Um, so let's go ahead and pull that up now. So this is just a pretty neat uh, implementation of GeoJSON where you have a map. Uh, you can go around and, and make points. So um, what we can do, I thought, let's see, we'll uh, scroll into Germany here. And since uh, ArangoDB is located in Cologne, and I have a rough idea. I've actually gotten to visit. Um, and I really, really love Cologne, actually. Um, hopefully, uh, someday I will hopefully even get to stay there for a bit longer. But I believe, where are we? I believe we are right around here. This is a, a, a little bit of a guess, but from memory, I think I think here, but uh, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, and so you see, as we dropped that point, now we have our type over here, which is a type feature. And then we have our geometry object, which is a point, and then the coordinates for that. So uh, if we wanted to, I'm actually located in Florida, and I know, don't hold it against me. <laughs> uh, I'm right around the, the Tampa area here. And then our other uh, location is in California, and that is a total guess as far as the location of that. Um, and so you see, as I was doing that, we have these features, and um, we're adding additional features that just contain uh, geometry points. So one example of something else outside of a geometry point is this poly, uh, is this uh, multi-point line or line string. Um, and we could draw that from all of these. And now we can see what the line string looks like. So the shape of that line string, since it has three points, contains an array with three uh, arrays within it, uh, three coordinate arrays. 
And so, uh, you know, as you begin, you can you can play around with this uh, geojson.io. There's no sign up for it or anything. It's it's pretty cool, and it's a really nice way to get an idea of of maybe just what some of these geojson objects look like. Um, all right, and uh, just uh, doing a quick chat check. Looks like no questions, so I'll keep moving on. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so getting back to the Arango search, this is just going to be a quick, uh, you know, idea on you know, for instance, kind of like how ArangoDB deals with data, the rough rough idea of a of interacting with ArangoDB as a database. And uh, of course, we have a ton of videos and tutorial content on this. So if you are interested, I'm not going to go over what's basically already been covered uh, a lot by us. But um, so RongoDB being a NoSQL database, we refer to our, our uh, collections of, of documents or collections of uh, data uh, as, as collections. Um, and so that's what we have here. And the normal uh, interaction you would have is you have you, happy developer over here, with your query, and then you're going to have some filters or, or whatever you might be trying to figure out that you would uh, be putting against the collection. So if you want to find all documents with, uh, you know, uh, if let's say our restaurant example, a restaurant you know cuisine type of uh, Mexican food, uh, then you're going to be able to query the collections for that and get your results, and you could potentially sort them. Where, where things get interesting here is these green sections. Uh, these are the Arango search specific sections. So in Arango search, we allow you to index uh, data and attributes from multiple collections at once. And so when you do a query, you query against this view, and now you're doing a, a fully federated search against multiple collections. And this analyze section here is actually uh, what we refer to as analyzers. And so this allows for doing things like uh, tokenizing strings or um, you know, if you need to convert all of your text to lowercase so that querying is, is a bit more reliable and consistent. Um, we have things such as um, uh, ingram match is our ingram analyzer, which allows for tokenizing it in a very specific way. And uh, this is also something that's multilingual. So it, it supports uh, a large number of languages. Um, and we have a, a, a lot more than I'm kind of like going over as far as uh, analyzers available. Uh, and one of the most recent analyzers that we added in version 3.8 was actually this GeoJSON analyzer. So now you can index and, and have access to all of these Orango search specific functions, uh, your GeoJSON data. And this would be really beneficial, especially in a situation like, like the restaurant one, or, or like we're going to see with Airbnb, where you might have coordinate information next to textual information that you want to be able to run a lot of these Arango search specific functions. Um, and since Arango search has access to ranking and similarity search functions, this can get really, really beneficial. So for instance, if you're doing like fuzzy search functions with our Levenstein match tools, this allows you to do things like autocomplete or dealing with uh, incorrectly spelled words or being able to try and like pin down more of the context of potentially what the user is searching for rather than just doing like a one-to-one -one lookup. Um, there's going to be a lot that goes there. And then once you have those results and once you, you have, have queried all these collections and maybe got exactly what your user was looking for, you still need a way to sort it. And so this is where our ranking feature comes in. We have built-in support for TF-IDF and BM25, um, which allows you to uh, rank, and then you can sort by the ranking. So hopefully getting the most relevant uh, contextual results uh, for, for whatever you're searching for. Um, so this is really the, the super quick version of of how we structure data in ArangoDB, and specifically how you're interacting with Arango Search through this Arango Search view. And this is just, um, yeah, at the end of the day, it just becomes a, a data source for your queries and allows for the multiple collections. Uh, we also have a lot of tutorials available on our site if you're interested there. OK, so as I mentioned, uh, we did just add a geospatial analyzer. And so uh, we actually have two. The GeoJSON one is going to be the more common one, allows for uh, indexing 
valid GeoJSON objects. We have another one called GeoPoint, which actually is for just raw coordinates. So maybe you're not specifically dealing with GeoJSON, you just have coordinate information, which is also common. Uh, you can actually use the GeoPoint analyzer for that as well. Um, whereas GeoJSON supports, you know, whatever whatever geometry you're working with. Um, and so, um, yeah, as, as I said, I covered those. Uh, and, and, and so kind of just mentioned this in the last one, but again, the, the great benefit of this is that uh, the Arango search indexing process makes access to this data and especially large amounts of data hyper fast and it keeps it consistent. It is eventually consistent. So whenever you insert documents, uh, the view will update it on its own. And not only does the access to it uh, become really fast because it's indexed in this way, it also provides access to geo-specific functions. So geo contains, geo distance, geo in range, geo intersects. And we'll actually take a look at how we use these. But so this allows you to uh, make use of your geospatial data by by doing relevant geo queries. Um, and this, of course, was really, really important and uh, useful for our Airbnb example. And this down here is just an example of how easy it is to create it. I think this might actually, if I recall, this is actually what we use. This is this is all you need to set up an analyzer in Arango DB. Is uh, you do this from the what we call the Arango shell or Ringosh, and you can just create an analyzer like this, and this will work. Especially with the GeoJSON, there's really not a lot of tweaking you have to do. The most common options are 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 definitely the ones that most people will use. You can adjust some features like the S2 uh, max max level cells and that sort of stuff if, if you're really familiar with it and, and that is important to you. But we found for the most part, you're probably not gonna need to change much here. Um, okay, yes, as promised, uh, we'll go ahead and take a real quick look at the site itself. And then I actually have an update that I thought was interesting from overnight. I was looking at this last night. Um, and uh, but we'll we'll see. Uh, okay, so here it is. I have it running on my local computer, but I also wanted to show that it's available here on our on the ArangoDB community GitHub, and uh, there's a full a walkthrough of how to get started with it. Um, especially with Docker to, Docker Compose, we had one of our community members, uh, Cowds, I believe, actually set this up for us. Uh, really, really awesome. Really appreciate that. I really appreciated all the help from our community members uh, in getting this project going. Um, but so the general, you know, the current features, I guess, are the ability to drag around on the map, get results, and uh, one thing that was especially interesting to figure out was getting these markers to work. Um, so for instance, you click on the marker, it gives you information about that listing. You can click on the listing to get more information. Uh, right now, we're actually only using a Berlin data set, but uh, we, we retrieved this data from uh, inside airbnb.com and that they have uh, information for uh, Airbnb listings across uh, a, a large uh, a large number of places. So definitely feel free to check that out. But um, and so this is this, or you can click this over here to also get the same thing, get information about it, uh, property information space, accommodates amenities, and so on. Um, and I'll kind of leave it there. But one last thing actually is that this feature, the ability to search, uh, we use the uh, I, be, I believe it's I believe it's Leaflet, um, but actually it might be OpenStreetMap as far as being able to do what's called geocode searching. And this was just our initial implementation, implementation but uh, as of last night, this worked. And I have it set up in a couple places. And uh, this is just one of those things. I saw today that, uh, well, it's spelled wrong, but uh, I saw today that they have updated the policy for interfacing uh, with this geocode service. Um, so I created a, a new issue this morning. So if you did want a way to get started uh, helping <laughs> would be to uh, take a look at this search functionality. Uh, one last thing was the filters. So you can filter by like things like room type, uh, amenities, as well as pricing. Um, and this will continually update the available amenities for the uh, markers that we have shown here. And so we can continue to like uh, wind down and it returns a, it returns a um, like a hundred results, I believe by default. So, um, and then you can get results like that and, and get more information about what you're looking for. So, um, yeah, definitely feel free to play around with that. Always, always happy for any new uh, contributions to that as well. But I believe I'll need to keep 
Moving on. Okay. Don't want to run out of time too much here. So uh, the initial requirements. So our initial requirements for this project were, were was to search an Airbnb data set, um, which we which we do, a uh, draggable map, use a Rongo search to keep everything fast, search the data set using the geographic coordinates that are provided within it, and filter for things like I was showing you in the filters. Uh, and of course, use AQL for everything uh, and having multilingual support. We do have that starting with the German data set. We can do things like uh, you know, acknowledging the symbols and, and that sort of stuff within the text. Um, right now, we don't have a big use for that, but uh, that's going to come along with some of the more uh, keyword-based searches. And uh, one of the things on the like um, list of things that would be cool or interesting to do would be to, to uh, kind of crawl the description and try and find any additional amenities or, or features to provide. Uh, we did all of this through GitHub. We used the GitHub projects, which allows you to get this sort of like Trello-like board um, that creates issues for you. We also got to use the discussions feature, which was really cool. That's how we found some of our community members that actually ended up creating a React front end in parallel to our view front end so that they both rely on the same back end. That was really cool. Um, and the data prep, I'm, I'm not going to try and speak too much through this, but I, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So, um, But the data prep step, um, for me, getting started with this is uh, I'm, I'm kind of a Python guy as well as a JavaScript guy. So uh, getting started in a Python notebook is, is, uh, is easy for me. Um, and so, for example, I, I provided a really, really basic example of uh, getting started with doing data exploration with maybe some really simple uh, data tools such as pandas. I think it's pandas and, and of course, like matplot to, to plot them. I don't even know if I ended up using matplot, actually. I take that back. So I think primarily just pandas and numpy uh, for this one. But for a lot of people, that's going to be how they're getting started. Um, but something else that I did was also I uh, wanted to really, really see what I could do with AQL and show that you can do this data exploration, data analysis, and then since the data is already in your database, now you can do the data, data transformation that you might want to do as a result of that um, alongside it. So for example, actually, I'll just take a look real quick at this article. If you are interested in the data modeling and data preparation side of it, I wrote up a full article talking about some of the challenges that we went through um, and some of the queries that we use. So for example, uh, one query that I needed to start out with was just getting uh, information about what what's uh, what data types do we have within this data? You know, for for someone, if you're just you know someone just plops some some data on your virtual desk and say, you know, figure out what we have here. What can we do with this? And this is where a lot of these questions and and a lot of this article covers is like, okay, do we need to clean up this data? Do we have uh, issues you know that we can detect early on in the data, which we did. Um, some things, you know, maybe there's more null values than we expected, or there's a, a formatting problem problem with some of the data, and so we can start doing some of these data cleanup tasks in advance. Um, and this was also part of our our uh, kind of like a migration. Uh, we started out with a bunch of CSV data, and so you know, it's going to be more uh, similar to like a relational database, but we needed in our you know NoSQL multi-model database. How do we start? Uh, combining some of these collections to be a bit to to leverage like the NoSQL features a bit more, um, and so all of these things. And so, for example, this query here um, generates the attributes that we had available in our data, the types, and the counts for them. And so we would find things like um, like I, I can remember one was a description value that one of them you know. Some of them, at least, that had numbers instead of actual text, you know, string descriptions, and and just really uh, being able to do this cleanup all within AQL uh, is actually super easy and and just really convenient because the data is already uh, located uh, on the database. So uh, there is that, and yeah, we'll go ahead and hop back into it. So uh, this is our a breakdown of the front end tools that we use. This was a Vue.js front end project. We used a Vue CLI to get started and Vue material for a lot of the styling, uh, which was great. Really, really like that. And uh, then, of course, Axios and then Leaflet and OpenStreetMap. That's the map that we're using. And for this 
this part, I am going to kind of uh, do something uh, that I'm sure is uh, foolish <laughs> and uh, try and do a really, really quick live coding example of how to add a leaflet map to your Vue.js application. I wanted to do this because it was surprisingly, uh, once I figured it out, I, I feel like it was surprisingly easy. So I'm going to bring over my terminal here. Uh, and we'll go ahead. I'm going to make this a bit bigger for us. Uh, how's that look? OK. OK, so I'm in my, my uh, terminal here. And so we use the Vue CLI, which allows for scaffolding a Vue project really quickly. And it's, it's really, really nice. So uh, I'm going to do Vue create. Uh, I'll just do Frost example. Oh. Oh, <laughs> OK, cross example. OK, and for our project, we just used Vue 2. Uh, it's still like the default, sort of. You could use Vue 3, I think, and, and this would work just fine. But uh, we started this you know, many, many moons ago, where Vue 2 was still definitely the, like, uh, the stable version. And so I think Vue 3 is probably uh, a more sensible uh, thing to go with at this point. But. Go ahead and let this spin up. And if all goes well, this is a, actually a fairly fairly quick process. Um, and I just thought it was kind of neat to show how quickly you can get started with all of this. And then we'll take a look after this at the back end. And I really wanted to show off like kind of there's like one primary query that we ended up building out that does all, all the bulk of the heavy lifting for our project. Um, this uh, should go pretty quick here. OK, so uh, what do we need Frost example. And so this is what our project structure looks like. Very uh, basic, kind of what you would expect. And I already know I need Leaflet. So I'm going to go ahead and install that. OK, now that it's installed. I feel a sneeze coming on, so if I do, I'll try and mute. Uh, I can go ahead and do npm run serve. Okay. Okay. So here's our standard Vue.js app, uh, and I've got the leaflet documentation up. Um, and then also, what I will do, I actually will open this in my code editor. And I'll bring this over in just a second here. OK, so here is the code editor with what we have. Uh, here's all of our project files. We can start with going to our Hello World app. And we can get rid of all of this, because we won't need that. And we also won't need props, for our example. Uh, we will need a methods, and we're going to call this setup. Uh, I have a I have one over here, so I'm not totally winging it, <laughs> just in case. Uh, so setup uh, leaflet map. Uh, this you don't have to name it this. It's just uh, whenever you start up a leaflet project, you've got to have something that sets up the map, and we're going to change this to be map, and it assigns itself to a uh, ID, so a div container within your project. And I want to show where we're pulling this from just because I want you to be able to do this on your own as well. So this is the leaflet.com or leaflet.js.com has the really basic like getting started. Here's how simple it is to put in. Um, and we're going to just copy that over. And I'll even, uh, and then I'll, I'm going to put that in that method that I made here. Uh, I don't like that. There we go. OK, and we'll need some import statements, of course. And so the import statements that we're actually going to bring is uh, one, there's some for leaflet here. So these are the two that you'll need, the leaflet CSS. And then uh, this import L, this is just the most common thing. As you see down here, this is this L we're talking about referring to leaflet itself. And then we've got two assets I'm going to bring in to show how we did the OrangaDB marker. 
paste those in here. Um, and, whoop, and it's complaining because we're not using it yet. And so uh, at this point, even, what we can do is get rid of some of this styling. Just do map here. And let's do what width, uh, 50 vertical width. Whoop. 50 height, we'll do the same thing. And then we'll auto. So all we're doing is really just trying to center this map and we need to give the map a size. So that's why that was important. And let's see if this is working or if it's complaining. This is the, the fun part where <laughs> we can see if we haven't had it working yet. Okay, it is not liking something. And I'll try and not get stuck here too much if it doesn't look like it's going to work. Map, that's in style. I might even just need to restart this. But what I will do is, well, oh, mounted, sorry. So yes, now that we have this, what the important part is like once our uh, Vue.js is um, ready to go. Once the actual map ID has been mounted, we need to actually call this setup function. It says, OK, now that we have the map ID up here available, we need to go ahead and set it up. And that's what we've got. So now we actually have a functioning uh, we have a functioning map already in, in just that quick. And I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to spend a ton more time. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this whole function I have over here, make all of our lives easier just to show you at the end of the day how easy it is to make a custom icon as well. And so that's what we've got here. Um, so this is how you can set up the icon. Um, it allows you for configuring the icon size and even where its placement is. You can have a, an offset for the, uh, the pop-up that happens with that anchor. Um, and so uh, that's all this is, is, is uh, you're, we're extending the leaflet icon um, to be able to, to add our own custom icon. And we do that by passing it through right here where we added it. And this add to functionality is the general flow for working with leaflet is the ability to add to. So um, a lot of the stuff will be adding to the map or adding to a layer of the map. Um, and then the OpenStreetMap tie-in here is that OpenStreetMap is actually doing all the tiling for this project. So that's the, the actual like art, basically, of the tiles here. And now you can see our new text for the pop-up using GeoJSON some of the Rongo search is awesome, and our little Arango search marker. And this is a completely draggable, so now you can start getting the coordinates and, and everything that you want throughout your project. And, and, and that's how easy it is. So uh, I really, really enjoyed working with Leaflet. And uh, my, I did not blunder too bad here, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, but OK, so let's go ahead and keep moving on. Just a, a real quick wrap up. The last thing I want to show you is using ArangoDB with KOA. KOA is a very Express-like uh, app for uh, creating your routes and, um, and this sort of thing. And, and we just found it, it was a lot easier. One of our community members was familiar with it. Um, and then for those that were curious, I use uh, Nginx and Docker on the actual server itself. So super, super quick version of this is uh, this is how our, our backend structure works. So we, we structured our project in workspaces. And so we have our front end for Vue and our front end for React. Um, and then uh, we have our Arango.js client where we import using our Arango.js. Uh, this is the official ArangoDB JavaScript driver. And we're dealing with the database object of that. And we pass this database object around uh, throughout our application, especially the API. And all we do here is set up the configuration, which is defined in our server config here, which just has our ArangoDB URL, database, username, and password. And we, we pass that here. Um, the imports for this are really, really small. Um, looking back at our server file, we're just dealing with KOA and ArangoDB, and that's it. Um, and uh, we can set up uh, error handling for all the routes here. Uh, that, that was also kind of a nice convenience is it, the ability to, to, to reuse this error handling. Um, we have a couple routes set up, but the main one I wanted to show you, and hopefully if we have time, would be this example of map results where we actually get our map coordinates. So that, that 
that map box that we're working with that I just showed you. And then we 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 form that. It's it's not quite GeoJSON coming from Leaflet, but we just form it as a bounding box and we pass that through to our query. Um, this is allowing us to do some of the filtering. And then we 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 build up our query, and this is our AQL query using our AQL template tag option, uh, which allows you to really like allows you to have the, the white space and everything that you'd want. And we pass that through, and uh, we get our cursor, which allows for we do it all in this situation because we know there's only 100 results. But if you needed to, you could do batch processing um, and work through the cursor as you needed, just like you would expect. Um, and then finally, the last thing that I did want to show you is actually this query in action. And uh, that will sort of tie into how you can get started on your own as well. So let me pull that back up. Um, this is using uh, Docker Compose. I'll make sure I stop this actually. So uh, hopefully that stopped correctly. Uh, OK. Um, so this is Docker Compose. Uh, this is set up by our community member. This allows you to start on RongoDB backend the React and Vue front ends um, all with one command. And it's really, really convenient. It's a really nice way to get started. Um, so now if we go to our, our same port, this localhost uh, 8080, that's uh, where we were at here. So I can just refresh that actually. And there you go. But now if we go to the default on DB port of 8529, we'll get that for some reason. Oh, it was trying to go somewhere else. There we go. No, there we go. Uh, so test, uh, there's a default password, I think, of one, two, three, or oh, not test, sorry, root. Um, that's defined in the in the Docker container, so be sure to check that out. And then here is our RongoDB data and collections um, and everything. We we have this calendar that we never ended up doing anything with, um, but I just, I'm kind of like zipping through this because I know I'm coming real up on time here. So, uh, but this is that query I was just showing you in the API where we, we are able to use our geo contains function. We pass through that rectangle that we received, and we're iterating through all of our listings and their location information. And here is where we're actually using that geo JSON analyzer. So we say we've got this box. We want coordinates uh, that are contained within this box. We need this geometry information. We, we provide ge geometry information, and we want to use the geometry type of point. Uh, and we want to find those points within this rectangle. And then not only do we want to do that, once we've found them, we want to make sure that they're aligning with our filters. So some filters, for example, that I put in here is that it can be of private room or it can be uh, an entire room and the listing room type. And you can continue filtering down. It needs to have Wi-Fi and heating. And we want our price to be between 30 and 50. And, and so on. And we actually even have uh, a sorting feature we're utilizing of a Rongo search that does this. And then we get the uh, filters so that we can update those filter checkboxes. Um, and we return that based on the results that we get from this. And this is the object that we return. And we run that. And oh, this is in the wrong format. There we go. And so then we get our listings and our filters. Um, and yeah, so so that's the bulk of it. And um, if you are interested, definitely, like I said, feel free to check out that project. Um, reach out to us on, on, you can even reach out to us on GitHub since we have that discussions feature enabled. Um, but then some next steps that we're looking at is a really cool use case that Airbnb actually posted on their engineering blog about doing entity detection. So taking in the images that customers provide and uh, being able to pick out uh, potentially amenities that they didn't list or uh, create new features that they can list on the listing based on the uh, entities that they're able to detect in the images. So that's a really cool sort of tie into some of our ML uh, work as well. We also just need some of this work building out user profiles and completing the whole uh, rental process flow. And uh, I have uh, no... Um, uh, no false expectations that uh, this code can be better. So spaghetti removal is probably finding some of this spaghetti code that I have created along the way and making that better. Uh, and then to add one more to that is this geocoding search that uh, overnight stopped working. So uh, if anybody has any suggestions or just really wants to contribute to a project like this, uh, definitely feel free to reach out. And, and we've got full uh, uh, instructions on how to do so in the README, as well as we have a community projects channel on our community Slack.
Um, all right, I think uh, I think that's it. I think I was able to get through it, and hopefully not too uh, over time here. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, that is where I'll stop. Thank you again for your time, and, and thanks Roscon for having me.